Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome everyone here to the uh, NZF Zakat Made Simple webinar. I can see uh, a lot of people are just jumping into the webinar right now. So uh, we'll just give it a minute or two. Um, I just saw in the last few minutes around 15 people have joined. So let's just uh, wait a minute and then we'll get started uh, in about two minutes here. Yeah, while we're waiting, uh, if you can type in the chat uh, where you're joining from, that would be great, just to get an idea of where everyone's uh, from. MashaAllah, Halifax. I don't know. Let's see if we can do coast from coast. I'm hoping there's someone from uh, Vancouver as well. Oakville, ah, oh, France, mashallah. Looks like the GTA and Calgary contingents are coming in strong. All right, let's get started. So, uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brothers and sisters. Thank you for joining us today uh, for this webinar with uh, Sheikh Naveed. And uh, <clears throat> before we begin, I'd just like to tell you briefly about uh, us, National Zakah Foundation of Canada. So, we are a Canadian charity, and our goal is to facilitate education, collection, and distribution of zakah in Canada. Uh, we've been here for 10 years, uh, serving the pillar of the deen which is Zakah. And uh, on this talk, we want everyone to come away with uh, a firm understanding of the fundamental of this pillar of our deen. <laughs> Just a few housekeeping rules. If you have any questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A section so we don't lose track of them inside the chat. Uh, you should be able to see two sections within the chat, the Q&A and a general chat. And if we aren't able to get to your question on time, uh, just keep in mind that we offer a variety of services. You can email us at uh, zakat at nzfcanada.com and we will go through your question. If it's a question that's very detailed and we need to refer to our shayukh, um, we will uh, check with them and email you back. You can also book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with our shayukh. Um, and uh, you, know, you can schedule that um, on our website. We'll share the link for that as well. And uh, in general, voice is not enabled for the participants on the webinar. So please do put the questions into Q&A. And uh, here I would like to introduce Sheikh uh, Naveed Aziz. So he's a dynamic Canadian Muslim uh, public figure who's dedicated his life to education and uplifting Muslim youth. So he has a diverse academic and social background and uh, he completed his education in Quebec and Saudi Arabia and began teaching and counseling for Al-Maghrib Institute, establishing himself as a sought after speaker on four continents and 18 countries. Currently, he serves as a director of religious and so social services for IISC or the Islamic Information Society of Calgary, 
and as a chaplain to the Calgary Police Services, working to enhance youth integration. He has multiple volunteer programs, uh, and in his free time, he enjoys uh, traveling and hiking the Canadian Rockies. So please uh, welcome Sheikh Naveed Aziz. Jazakallah khair, Kamran. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Can I take over? Yes, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inahu wa nasta'afiruh. Wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihillahu fala mudhillalahu wa man yudhlilhu fala hadiya lah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallahu ahdahu la sharika lahu. Ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira. Amma ba'd. اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا فعلمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علم يا كريم آمين يا رب العالمين. My dear brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. And جزاكم الله خيرا for joining me today in this important webinar with regards to zakat simplified. So I want to give a, a brief introduction بإذن الله تعالى to my approach and what we will be discussing today. So number one, I want to emphasize the importance of all of the believers taking it upon themselves to seek knowledge. So it's very, very important that you have a strategic plan with regards to how you understand Islam. And one of the main chapters in the books of fiqh that you'll find is the chapter of zakat. So what we're providing today is a summarized version for those that have not had the opportunity yet to study this chapter in detail. So this will be a summary for them. Number two, it's important to have uh, a mufti that you refer your questions to. So for those of you that do not have a mufti or do not have access to someone that you can ask your questions to and, and get a verified answer, then inshallah ta'ala, I'm hoping that this presentation will suffice. But if you do have a mufti that you refer to and that you seek knowledge with, then please refer back to the fatwa of your mufti and stick to that bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Number three, with regards to the opinions being shared today, so this presentation was created by National Zakat Foundation Canada, and it provides opinions that are within a valid spectrum of halal opinions on this chapter of fiqh. And what I've seen in my study of the presentation is that it does what is best for those that are needy and deserving of zakat, that those that, that which is best for those that are deserving and needy of zakat. And I'll explain that in some of the sections as we go on, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. So this is not a holistic presentation, nor is it an exhaustive presentation, but this is just an introduction to the chapter of zakat with regards to what people need to know. Now, I want to start off with this uh, simple and fundamental point. Zakat locally. Why is that uh, important? When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu to Yemen, he gave him very specific instructions. He tells him, take from the wealth of the rich and distribute it amongst their poor. And distribute it amongst their poor poor. So what we see is that the sunnah with regards to zakat is that it should be distributed locally where you are in the country that you are in, starting off with the city that you're in, then the province that you're in, and then expanding outwards if all the needs of the people have been met or and or if you have relatives in those areas. And this is something we can discuss later on. And this is something that MashaAllah Tabarakallah National Zakat Foundation Canada has done a very good job of establishing in regards to Canadians giving their zakat locally, as this is the sunnah. Now, one of the things we often hear is, I can get more bank for my buck if I distribute zakat internationally. So for example, $1 over here will only get you so far, but $1 in my country back home can do X, Y, and Z with it. Now, while that is the case, then still the sunnah still remains that it should be distributed locally and every group of people are responsible for taking care of their own locality. And if a locality cannot be taken care of, then those that are surrounding that locality are responsible for it. The only exception that should be made is with regards to relatives and helping them. So that's just a brief introduction that I wanted to share with all of you and something to keep in mind as you decide to give your zakat this year. Choose to give your zakat locally as that is the sunnah. So now, let us begin with the PowerPoint presentation. Bismillah. 
Here we go. So Zakat Made Simple by National Zakat Foundation. We firstly start off with the verse in Surah At-Tawbah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishes the categories to whom uh, zakat is due. So after a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَالْعَامِلِينَ عَلَيْهَا وَالْمُؤَلَّفَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَفِي الرِّقَابِ وَالْغَارِمِينَ وَفِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ فَرِيضَةً مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, As-sadaqat, over here meaning as zakat is only for the fuqara and the masakeen and those employed to collect the funds and to attract the hearts of those who have been inclined towards Islam and to free the captives and for those in debt and for Allah's cause and the wayfarer, a traveler who is cut off from everything, a duty imposed by Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knower and all wise. So let us start off with a couple of things. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins this verse by saying innama and innama it uh, implies exclusivity in the sense that zakat can only be applied to these categories and zakat cannot be applied to categories outside of it. So we'll be discussing these eight categories, ta'ala. but what I want you to pay attention to is you're not going to see hospitals here. You're not going to see madrasas over here. You're not going to see water wells over here. All of those categories that we're referring to should be taken from one sadaqah and not from one's zakat, and not from one's zakat. So that's something important to keep in mind, that sadaqa you can give everywhere. But with regards to zakat, there's very exclusive categories that zakat can be applied to. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions eight categories that it can be applied to, and we'll be going through each category in detail. And I want to jump to the ending of the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, faridatam min Allah. Wallahu alimun hakim. That this is an obligation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing and all wise. So when something becomes an obligation, what that means is if you do it, you are rewarded, but if you don't do it, you are actually sinful. You're actually sinful. What this also means is that giving zakat is one of the best ways to earn the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to earn the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is that so? The fact that in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that my slave does not come closer to me than anything other than that which I have obligated, uh, uh, obligated, meaning that the things that we get closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with are the obligatory deeds. And when we do those obligatory deeds, we earn the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We learn the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, there are many, many repercussions to not giving zakat, to not giving zakat. From the repercussions of not giving zakat are famine and drought. From the repercussions of not giving zakat is that uh, our wealth will turn into a snake and wrap itself around us and you know, uh, strike our face. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that our wealth will turn into metal plates and we will be cast, meaning those metal hot iron plates will be uh, put on us and we will be burnt and this will be repeated for a day of 50,000 years. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. So when it is said that it is an obligation, meaning we have to take it very, very seriously. And this is why Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu in his khilafah, he fought those that did not pay zakat. He fought those that did not pay zakat. Wallahu alimun hakim. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing and all wise. All knowing in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what we are capable of giving and the impact that it can have meaning that he only commanded us to give 2.5%, and that 2.5% is enough to make a big difference. And all wise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the amazing things that can happen if we all of us were to accept this responsibility of giving zakat and embrace this institution of zakat. So these are just some of the benefits that we can take from this verse. Now let's look at those eight categories. Oh, there we go. So the fuqara are those that have nothing to their name. Classically, the ones that have no means of income and no money. 
Contemporarily, one who possesses less than 50% of what is required to fulfill their basic needs of the year. So I want you to think of your uh, expenses that are considered a necessity, like food, like shelter, like electricity, like transportation, all of those things are considered a necessity. And if you have less than 50% of ability to fulfill those expenses, then an individual is considered from the fuqara. And this is the first category that is mentioned as they are the most eligible. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the masakin, those who have some level of income or money, but not enough. In other words, they may have more than 50% of what they need, but not 100% of what is needed to fulfill their basic needs. Now, you would be surprised, my dear brothers and sisters, the level of Muslims that now fall under this category, subhanAllah. In a post-pandemic reality, the demand for zakat has drastically gone up. And this has several reasons behind it. Inflation being at the head of them, that the cost of everything has pretty much become more expensive. Number two, a lot of people have lost their jobs and no longer have stable sources of income and a variety of other reasons. Some are struck by mental health issues. Some are struck by physical issues that they're unable to work. But regardless, the demand for zakat has drastically gone up and this the number of people that now uh, fall under the category of masakin subhanallah is almost mind boggling may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make things easy for us and them amen then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he goes on to say al amilina alayha those that collect and distribute the zakat so during the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the early predecessors uh, and in fact, for a, a lot of the early uh, caliphates, there was this concept of a Baytul Mal, and that was the Muslim treasury, where the wealth would be collected, and they would hire individuals to go and collect people's zakat, and also hire individuals to distribute the zakat. So those individuals that are hired to collect and to distribute, they were allowed to be paid from the zakat itself. They were allowed to be paid from the zakat itself, whatever would be considered an average wage for that position, whatever would be considered an average wage for that position. And this does not mean that they are necessarily poor or needy, and they're paid for the service to maintain the institution of zakat, paid for the service to maintain the institution of zakat. And from this, we can extract that institutions that distribute zakat are actually eligible to take a percentage of that zakat money. Are actually eligible to take a percentage of that zakat money. Bismillah. So oftentimes, you know, it's human nature to find uh, those organizations that have zero overhead costs and give 100% of your donation. But on a realistic and practical level, in order to sustain an organization, there needs to be a source of income for the institution that will allow it to sustain itself. And the institution of zakat has that built in. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions al-mu'allafati qulubuhum, those whose hearts are to be softened with zakat. And they are several categories. They are several categories. But this shows us something very important on how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leverages the love for wealth within humans. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, And that mankind has an ever extensive love for wealth. And we see this in the Islam of quite a few individuals, one of them being Safwan ibn, uh, Safwan ibn Umayyah, uh, who accepted Islam after uh, Hunayn. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was giving uh, camels out and his eyes saw a set of camels and the Prophet gave it to him, even though he was non-Muslim. And he asked for more and the Prophet ﷺ gave him. And he asked for more and the Prophet ﷺ gave him. Till he mentions that I became shy to ask the Prophet ﷺ for any more. For surely Muhammad ﷺ gives without fear of poverty. For surely Muhammad ﷺ gives without fear of poverty. So this shows us that wealth can be used to soften the heart's of people towards that which is good, towards that which is good. Now, let's look at the categories and subtypes. Number one, 
This can be Muslims. So zakat funds are given in order to solidify their iman. So these are perhaps new Muslims or Muslims whose iman is not as strong yet. So wealth can be used to solidify their iman and to make them more comfortable uh, in their life. It can be used for a non-Muslim who is, you know, interested in Islam and is eager to learn about Islam. And zakat can be used to soften their hearts even further. And then the last category is an evil person to ward off his or her evil. So someone that is known to constantly harm uh, and steal and to do other things. And if you were to just, you know, pay them off, they would go away. Then zakat can potentially be used as uh, a source over here. But this is something that requires a high level of due diligence and understanding of the situation. Firraqab, the slave or the captive in order to get their freedom. And traditionally, the, this is for those that were captured in times of war and they would be freed thereafter uh, based upon being bought. So if someone bought them, then they would be freed. And this example of someone like this is Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu purchased him and set him free. So zakat could have been used at that time. Now, contemporarily, how do we understand this? They have uh, subtypes. A slave who has made a contract to earn his or her freedom can uh, zakat can be used to free them. A slave whose freedom can be purchased straight out from zakat funds. A Muslim in captivity who can earn his or her freedom. And most common in the Canadian context, get legal counsel to a Muslim or pay for their release from jail if it is proven that they were wrongly accused and are innocent and are innocent. So these are, um, you know, these subtypes of it. And the last one is the most common in our Canadian context. So getting legal counsel to help them get out, posting their bail, or if there's a situation where uh, a bond can be paid to uh, have them released, then this would be uh, permissible to use zakat as well in that situation. al mean those who are in debt. And subhanAllah, it is getting very, very scary, the percentage of Canadians that are actually in debt. And I want to speak about this uh, very quickly. From an Islamic position, the fundamental base rule with regards to debt is that it is highly, highly discouraged. Highly, highly discouraged. Meaning you should only get into debt if you, have, uh, if you absolutely have to. If you absolutely have to. If there's another recourse for you, then you should seek that. And getting into debt should be one of the last things that you should do. What is the basis for this opinion? Well, we know that it is allowed in Islam and that can, it cannot be prohibited. So based upon the other hadith where the Prophet ﷺ sought refuge from being in debt and where the Prophet ﷺ refused to pray the janazah of those that were in debt, then this shows us that being in debt, it is allowed, but it is highly discouraged. It is highly discouraged. Now, what is the type of debt that qualifies one for zakat? It is debt that incurred due to a legal and halal need. So meaning that if you have a need of yours that needs to be fulfilled and it is halal, and thus you got into debt at that time, then zakat can be paid to pay off that debt. A second qualifier is that income and wealth are not sufficient to pay off that debt, meaning the individual that is in debt does not have the ability themselves to pay off that debt, does not have the ability themselves to pay off that debt. If they do, then they are required to pay off that debt. They are required to pay off that debt. And again, I emphasize my dear brothers and sisters that it is very scary to be in debt. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from it and if we are in it may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us to pay it off Allahumma ameen like can you imagine the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam refusing to pray the janazah of those individuals that were in debt and some of the scholars interpreted this as that they were in debt and had the ability to pay it off but did not do so so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam himself did not pray their janazah did not pray their janazah so it is a very scary reality now, further notes is that necessities of life like housing, furniture, clothes, and vehicles, or any source of income like a small business or land used as a source of income 
are not considered, are not considered. So an individual having these things, then they would not be considered with regards to an individual being uh, able to pay off their debt or not. Meaning that if you're in debt, you're not required to sell your house in order to pay off that debt or the furniture or your clothes or your vehicle or your business or uh, another source of income that you have, like the land that you live on, they are not to be considered. Now, it is mentioned in the classical books of fiqh, those who spend in order to settle a dispute between two parties, NZF does not generally come across this. Meaning that if there are two parties that are distributing and you want to be able to bring them together, then uh, zakat money can be used at that time. Zakat money can be used at that time, but this does not happen very often. So to summarize, an individual that is in debt for a halal need of theirs, for a halal need of theirs, that they cannot pay off for themselves, then zakat can be used to help them. Fi sabilillah. This is perhaps the most contentious of the categories, and this is in the path of Allah. Traditionally, it meant the Muslim army that was going out, but in our day and age, contemporarily, a lot of scholars have said that it is any activity deemed to be a necessity to protect the identity of Muslim societies in this land could be eligible to receive zakat funds under this category. And this is a very slippery slope. This is a very slippery slope. So there are a couple of things to look at. So advocacy groups that are out there, mental health groups that are out there, uh, you know, education institutions that are out there, DAWA organizations that are out there, with such a broad definition, they can become eligible for zakat. They, sorry, I, I pressed back by mistake. They can become eligible for zakat, but should we be so expansive in our de definition? And this goes back to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions those eight categories specifically, mentioned those eight categories specifically for a reason to exclude everything else to exclude everything else and we want to and when we try to become more inclusive under the definition of fisa bilillah this is contrary to the spirit of zakat this is contrary to the spirit of zakat so in my opinion and this is just me expanding on this i think those organizations that are actively engaged in dawah can be eligible and for everything else, we should be generous and give from our sadaqah to support the other organizations out there, to support the other organizations out there. This is how I would interpret the modern day fi sabilillah, the modern day fi sabilillah. And NZF has their inclusion as well. And we share both opinions under the spectrum of validity. Now, Ibn as Sabil, it is the traveler who is stranded and needs financial assistance. Assistance travelers who have lost their belongings and means of return in modern times when means of communication have become widely available and this person is wealthy, he or she may have easy access to their funds and therefore they do not deserve zakat money. If this person falls into one of the first two categories, fuqara and masakin, they should be given from zakat funds. And even if they are in debt, even if they are in debt as well. And another modern day application of this and even traditionally, our students of knowledge, our students of knowledge that leave their homes and go to lands uh, in order to study Islam and to come back and teach their communities, if they are not wealthy and do not have a means of supporting themselves, then they should be supported through zakat. They should be supported through zakat. Now, a summary of these eight categories, the fuqara, those that have nothing to their name or contextually, less than 50%. The masakin, those that have a little bit and not enough to survive, between 50 to 99% of their needs. Al-amilina alayha, those that distribute the zakat collecting and distributing. Al-muallafati qulubuhum, using it to soften the hearts of the people. Wafirraqab, those that are captive and prisoners, their legal fees to help them get out bonds that can be paid or collateral that can be given to free them as well. Those that are indebted with something halal and don't have a way to pay it off. Fi sabilillah in the way of Allah and Ibn al-Sabil, the traveler, which was the last one that we discussed. So these are the eight categories that are eligible for zakat and everything else sadaqah should be given towards. Sadaqah should be given toward, towards. Now, 
unlawful recipients of zakat. And before we proceed, I will just quickly check the, ta the chat box. We have uh, a couple of people giving salams. Perfect. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. And we have a question. Uh, as salamu alaikum. Are funds that are set aside specifically for retirement and invested zakat eligible? For example, funds in RRSP, if they are zakat eligible, how does this differ from people who have a DB pension? As I don't think pension contributions are zakat eligible, would this be disadvantageous for those who are self-employed or who don't have a job with a pension? Jazakallahu khairan. Inshallah, we will be answering this later on during the investment section. Bi'iznillahi ta'ala. So, since there are no further questions, let us proceed. Unlawful recipients of zakat. Bismillah. The rich. So as we saw from the categories of zakat, zakat is not meant to be given to the rich. It is meant to be for the poor and needy. It is meant to be for the poor and needy. Bismillah. So if an individual has enough money to survive and has enough money to pay off their bills and their necessities, then uh, they are considered rich and are not eligible for zakat. Exceptions to this rule are those that are collectors and workers of zakat. They can't fall under that category. Those that uh, purchase things from the Baytul Mal or things that have been collected of zakat, a rich person can, be ben can benefit from them. And if a poor person who has been receiving zakat invites a rich person to their house, the rich person is allowed to eat from it. And this is from the wisdom of the Sharia that we take the feelings of people into consideration. We don't want to offend people. We don't want to offend people and we want to be polite and courteous to our hosts, to our hosts. So if an individual is invited and that person is a, a zakat eligible person and is receiving zakat, you are still allowed to eat from their home. And inshallah, this builds a bonds of brotherhood and sisterhood and builds uh, bonds of love as well. Number two, those that are capable of earning and income and are choosing not to do so, and are choosing not to do so. Meaning that if an individual is fully bodied and able, their mental health is in good condition, they're not suffering from any chronic illnesses or diseases, they have the aptitude and the um, mental capacity to go and get a job and are not doing so, uh, even if they become poor, they do not become eligible for zakat. They do not become eligible for zakat. They are required to go and get a job, even if it means getting a job that is uh, not at par with their standards. So some people may feel humiliated if they work at a fast food restaurant or if they work uh, as a driver or a transporter of food. You know, you can think of the, the modern day examples that are out there. You know, some people may feel humiliated doing that. But if that is the job that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made easy for you and you're choosing not to do so, then this would not make an individual eligible to receive zakat. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, it is not permissible to give charity to a rich man, one who is independent of means or to one who is strong and healthy and capable of working. Narrated Ubaidullah ibn Adi ibn al Khiyar, two men informed him that they went to Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam asking for sadaqah. He then looked at them up and down and seeing that they were strong said, If you wish, I will give you something, but there is no share in it for a rich man or for one who is strong and able to earn a living. For one who is strong and able to earn a living. So this shows us that zakat cannot be given to those that are able to work and do not have valid excuses from the lens of the Sharia. Number three, non-Muslims. As a general rule, this group is not eligible to receive zakat. So if they are from the fuqara or from the masakin or the gharimin or, the, uh, or in the riqab, then the general rule is that they are not eligible to receive zakat up and until all the Muslims have been taken care of, up and until all the Muslims have been taken care of. The exception to this obviously is al-mu'allafati qulubuhum. And there are different opinions with regards to this. And I believe the view that it is allowed is very strong. The view that it is allowed 
is very strong. And opinion one is zakat can be given if they are inclined towards Islam. This is the view of the Maliki and Hanbali Madhab. And opinion number two is zakat cannot be given to them. This is the view of the Hanafi and the Shafi'i Madhab. And they said that they would have to enter Islam first. And in order to strengthen them, then zakat can be given to them. Then zakat can be given to them. Zakat for mental health services. So this goes to... Um, you know, the the, uh, the the Fisa Bilila clause that we were talking about, this is something that has been used under the guise of inclusion. So now zakat may be used in the following areas for beneficiaries who are zakat eligible. So the key thing that we want to look at is if those individuals are zakat eligible based upon the previous uh, criterion and eight categories that are mentioned, then zakat money can be used to provide counseling related to drugs, addictions, depression, anxiety, and anger management, marriage counseling, respite workers, speech therapy, and psychotherapy. So under the guise of fi sabilillah and them being eligible to receive zakat, then this would show that uh, zakat can be used in these circumstances as well for those that are zakat eligible, for those that are zakat eligible. Now, the fundamentals of Nisab, fundamentals of Nisab. And I just want to quickly check. Uh, no new questions. Perfect. So let us continue, inshallah ta'ala. So if a person's wealth is below the Nisab, they do not pay zakat. So we will translate uh, Nisab as the threshold. So Nisab is the threshold that one's wealth must reach to be liable to pay zakat. So when we're looking at when does zakat become mandatory? So zakat is not mandatory upon everyone. Zakat becomes mandatory when an individual reaches the threshold. And we will discuss what that is. And they have access to it for a full entire Islamic year. And they have access to it for a full entire Islamic year. Then zakat becomes mandatory in that situation. Then zakat becomes mandatory in that situation. So from the categories of zakat is gold and silver. And currency takes the ruling of gold and silver. Currency takes the ruling of gold and silver. So there is no individual authentic hadith about the nisab of gold. However, the scholars have consensus that it is 20 gold dinars based on numerous ahadith, which put together reach the level of acceptability. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to take zakat from people in every 20 dinars, half a dinar. So 20 dinars, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would take half a dinar, meaning 2.5%. 2.5%. Or Rubu Ushar. Rubu Ushar is 2.5%. And the silver Nisab is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam found in, as is found in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Mus uh, and in others. For silver, the zakat is 1 40th of the lot. And if its value is less than 200 dirhams, zakat is not required. If the owner wants to pay, he or she can. He or she can. So, for gold, it is the equivalent of 85 grams or more. And for silver, it is the equivalent of 455 grams or more. Now, there is some dispute with regards to the actual amount in grams. Some of the scholars have said 87.5 grams of gold and 495 grams of silver. But I believe these are technicalities. I believe these are two technicalities. So 200 dirhams or 20 dinars. Dinars are made out of gold, dirhams are made out of silver, and that is how zakat is calculated. Now, if we were to convert this into cash, what does this come out to? 20 dinars or uh, 700, uh, 7, uh, sorry, 20 dinars or 85 grams of gold is the equivalent of 7,050 Canadian dollars. And this is something that fluctuates, keep in mind, with the value of, and price of gold in Canadian dollars. And the nisab of silver is 200 grams or 595 grams. I apologize. I uh, had a, a slip and lapse in the memory. I said 455, but 595 grams, 595 grams, which is the equivalent of 625 Canadian dollars, 625 Canadian dollars. Why the difference? 
because 20 dinars used to equal 200 dirhams, used to equal 200 dirhams. Now the rate is very, very different. As you can see the disparity that it is more like, you know, one to a hundred as opposed to one to 10. So it is safer to go with the silver nisab. Yes, without a shadow of a doubt, it is safer to go with the silver nisab, but do understand there is a difference of opinion. Some scholars have stuck with the gold nisab because you can imagine that if we stuck with the silver nisab, if an individual has more than $625 in their bank account, are they considered to have a comfortable living? And the answer to that is no, not necessarily, because $625 can disappear very, very quickly. So they said that you can stick to gold, but without a shadow of a doubt, silver is safer. Silver is safer. So what is zakat paid on? What is zakat paid on? And I noticed that we got another question. If relevant, I'll answer it right away. Do we have to pay zakat on gold jewelry? Also, what about gold that we do not wear, i.e. in the bank, or gold squares received as a mahar? Gold squares received as a mahar. So, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, the answer to this is coming up very, very shortly. The answer to this is coming up very, very shortly. Bismillah. So, these are the categories of which we pay zakat on. You have cash and liquid assets, gold and silver, jewelry, coins, bullion, debts owed to you, amount of money lent to others that will be repaid confidently, shares and investments, different types, properties and other fixed assets, and those that are uh, particularly on sale, pension funds, RRSP, RESP, TFSA, and others, and business assets. Let us go through this. So, pay zakat if you meet the following criteria. Have complete ownership of the wealth. Wealth is free from haram income. Zakat is not due on earnings from haram sources. Haram wealth must be disposed of by giving it in charity and seeking forgiveness from Allah. So, for example, if you have a bank account and you're earning interest on it, Step number one, speak to your bank to turn off the interest. Number two, calculate the amount of interest that you have earned. Give it away. You will not be rewarded for it. This is you purifying your wealth and you seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, wealth meets the nasab, the threshold of wealth. One must own to be liable to pay zakat. And we mentioned the 85 grams of gold or the 595 grams of silver. And you have to have possession of it for one lunar year. One lunar year. Now, a lot of people are in the habit of paying their zakat in the month of Ramadan. There is no specific virtue of paying your zakat in the month of Ramadan. In fact, it can be given in any month. And in fact, zakat should be distributed when people are most in need of it. So if someone is in need right now, you shouldn't say, I'm going to wait till the month of Ramadan to give my zakat, but rather you should give it right away. And zakat can also be given in advance. Zakat can also be given in advance. In some opinions, up to three years in advance. So you can calculate your zakat for each year. And if you've given it in advance, then you can subtract that amount. You can subtract that amount. So these are the criteria that need to be fulfilled for zakat to become obligatory upon an individual. Now, use cases. Let's look at those. Jewelry. Do I have to pay or not? There is a difference of opinion regarding paying zakat on jewelry you regularly wear. NZF stance is that zakat should be paid on all forms of jewelry. So whether you wear it regularly or not, the stance of the National Zakat Foundation is that zakat should be paid on all forms of jewelry. For gold and silver mixed with other materials, 50% or more must be gold or silver to be zakatable, to be zakatable. If it is less than 50% of gold and silver, it is not zakatable. So if a gold bracelet is 75% gold and 25% other metals, and the total weight is 120 grams, then zakat is paid on 90 grams of the gold in it, 90 per, uh, grams of the gold in it. So you look at the pure gold and the pure silver, that is in the jewelry, that is in the jewelry. And as we mentioned, the stance of National Zakat Foundation 
is that zakat should be paid on all jewelry. Now, when a person's wealth is entirely in gold jewelry only, if weight is under 85 grams, there is no zakat due. If weight is a more than 85 grams, 2.5% zakat is due on it. 2.5 per second zakat is due on it. Getting the value. Contact a local jeweler. Tell them the purity of your gold and how many carats and the weight. The jeweler will give you the resale value. Take that price and apply 2.5% to determine its zakat, uh, to determine the zakat due. Or alternative, alternatively, find a spot price of your gold online and then apply 2.5% of zakat on it. So you can look up online that if something is 22 karat gold, then it's approximately you know 90 point something uh, percent pure. So you multiply that uh, number uh, with the total weight of it. And therefore that is the amount that you will pay your zakat on. And then you subtract the amounts as they go down. So 24 is the purest form of gold, then 22. And then it goes down to 18 mainly, and so on and so forth. So you can calculate it that way as well. Zakat and student loans. So now an individual that is not making payments right now, then there's nothing for you to deduct. There's nothing for you to deduct. However, if you are making payments right now, then you can deduct 12 months of upcoming principal payments. 12 months of upcoming principal payments, meaning not including interest, not including interest. So your zakatable assets are 5,000 and you pay $200 towards your student loan, of which 150 is towards the principal and $50 is interest. So therefore 150 times 12 is 1,800. This 1,800 is your deductible. Your net zakatable assets are 5,000 minus 1,800, meaning 3,200. Zakat rate of 2.5% is applied to 3,200, and therefore $80 of zakat is due. Therefore, $80 of zakat is due. Bismillah. And this is a very good example over here because this also shows us the guaranteed up and coming expenses that you will have that you know you're going to have to pay. So, for example, if you have rent, if you have electricity, if you have um, you know, uh, transportation costs, all of that is eligible to be deducted from your uh, net zakatable assets, from your net zakatable assets. And that is how you would calculate your zakat. So this is a very good example that if an individual has a student loan, then uh, this is a good way to calculate your zakat, to calculate your zakat. Properties. Zakat on properties depends on the intention and how the property is being utilized. So your own residence, there's no zakat that is due on it. Any properties that you're getting rent from only, then there's no zakat on the property. However, the income that you get from those properties minus your expenses, then zakat needs to be paid on that. And then the third scenario is you have a property that you're undecided. Am I going to sell it? Am I not going to sell it? As soon as you make the intention to sell it, then it becomes considered merchandise and then it becomes eligible for zakat. It becomes eligible for zakat at a price of 2.5%. So let's read through the notes. Zakat on properties depends on the intention and how the property is being utilized. Scenario number one, a property you own and live in. No zakat on value of property. Scenario number two, property you own that is rented out. No zakat on value of property. However, zakat is due upon the rent you have accumulated from the rental property. Of course, whatever you have spent is not zakatable. Whatever you have spent is not zakatable. Scenario number three, properties for sale or with the intention to sell. If you buy and sell houses and your zakat due date comes up while you own a property, it is a zakatable amount in the value. Uh, amount is the value of the house. You may pay zakat after the property is sold and you have cash available. So for example, if you've had the property for one full Islamic year and it's being sold and it hasn't sold yet, then add to that time, you calculate 2.5% of the value of the house. And then you uh, pay zakat on that and you are allowed to pay to delay the paying of the zakat on this house if you do not have uh, liquidity, meaning you do not have access to direct cash. 
And then if that is the case, as soon as you sell the house, then you give your zakat on the house at that time. But all other zakat should be paid on time. All other zakat should be paid on time. Scenario number four, no intention with the owned property. It is possible that you're not clear about the intent behind the property or asset. In this case, no zakat is due until you change your intention to sell. Until you change your intention to sell. Zakat on shares and investments. Short-term investments, this is an intention not to hold for more than one Islamic year. Example, your day trading or swing trading. The zakatable amount is include the entire value of your portfolio and pay zakat on it. You're treating it like cash. You're treating it like cash due to the fact that you are day trading and swing trading and not holding it for more than one full Islamic year. If you are holding it for more than one full Islamic year, this would be considered a long-term investment. And this is your intention to hold for more than a lunar year. An example, these investments could be held in TFSAs or RSPs and so on and so forth. Then the zakatable amount is the zakatable portion of the companies you hold shares in. How? Use the asset ratio formula. Now, we're going to quickly present it over here, but you will see that uh, National Zakat Foundation has multiple videos on how to pay zakat on investments. If you require more information, please watch those videos on YouTube. You can just go to the National Zakat Foundation YouTube channel and look up zakat on investments, and you can find it there, bismillah <laughs> ta'ala. Now, as a summary, what is the asset ratio formula? So zakatable asset ratio formula is the zakatable portion of shares which is zakatable asset ratio times current value of your holdings. Now, how do we get the zakatable asset ratio? We're going to look at that very quickly. So the zakatable asset ratio is the total current assets of the company divided by the market cap, meaning what type of assets does the company have and what is their total value divided by the total value of the company? That is the zakatable asset ratio. Here is an example to make things clear. So you are a long-term investor. You own 10 stocks of company Z. Company Z's total current assets are 154 billion and their market cap, meaning their total value is 2 trillion and their current stock price is $120. So now the zakatable asset ratio uh, is the total current assets of 154 billion divided by the total value of the company, which is 2 trillion, which gives you a total of 0 0.077. So that is your zakatable asset ratio. Now that you have this number, current value of your holdings in dollars, so you have 10 shares, you multiply it by $120, which is the price per a stock which gives you a total of $1,200, $1,200. Now you take the zakatable asset ratio, which is 0 0.077, you multiply it by $1,200, and it gives you a total of $92.40, $92.40. And you take that number and multiply it by 2.5%, multiplied by 2.5%, which gives you $2.31, which gives you $2.31. Now, this is for long-term investing. If you're doing day trading or swing trading, you do it on the total value. So for the same company, if you were to swing trade and day trade, let us open up our calculators. We take the $1,200 times 2.5% uh, and you get $30. You get $30. So you notice the difference between swing trading and long-term investing. And you are allowed to treat your long-term investments like cash. That extra amount that you give, you will be rewarded for, but it is not something you are required to do. It is not something that you are required to do. So you can see that there is a big difference. There is a big difference in the way that you calculate zakat, in the way that you calculate zakat between long-term and short-term investments on the same company you have a difference of approximately $27.70 $27.70 
and 70 cents. So now let's talk about Zakat on RESP, Registered Education Savings Plan. RESPs can be liquidated prior to children's education. Thus, the fund is Zakatable. However, you only pay Zakat on the amount you contributed plus minus any growth or loss. For example, your RESP contains $12,000 of which you contributed $10,000 and the government contributed $2,000. And under this calculation, we are assuming that there is no growth. You will deduct the government contribution, and this would be the penalty for early withdrawal prior to maturity. So the zakat that would be calculated is 2.5% of 10,000, which is $250, which is $250. Now, this is the assumption that you are either holding cash in this account or you're day trading and swing trading. If you're not day trading and swing trading, then you would use the, uh, the ratio that we discussed in the previous slide, the Zakatable Asset Ratio. That is what you would use instead over here, depending on what you are using in your RESP account. Now, how about the RRSP? Registered Requirement Savings Plan. If you have access and most of them are accessible or controllable, then Zakat is due on them. Then Zakat is due on them. RRSPs are accessible and thus Zakatable. Remember to deduct the withholding tax. So, so Zakat on RRSP is total RRSP value minus the withholding tax, minus the withholding tax which can be approximately 30 to 35% uh, depending on where you are and the tax bracket that you're in and so on and so forth. Note generally, the same rules apply to self-directed RRSPs and group RRSPs with regards to Zakat. So let's take a look as, as to what that would look like. Uh, or actually we move on to retirement funds. So the example is, for the uh, registered retirement income funds. So consider someone who has 500,000 in the registered requirement income fund, withdrawing $35,000 per year for living expenses. So 500,000 times 70%, uh, so we're using a 30% withholding tax, equals 350,000. Zakat on the 350,000 is 8,750. That's 25%. Uh, of what they are withdrawing for living expenses. That's 25% of what they are withdrawing for living expenses. The alternative is consider the RIF as an investment property and pay Zakat on the withdrawal amount. So if you were to pay your Zakat on the whole entire amount, you can imagine that you would end up losing a lot of money. And that is why there is an alternative. And that alternative is to treat it like an investment property where you only pay zakat on the amount that you are withdrawing. You only pay zakat on the amount that you are withdrawing, which is uh, $35,000 per year. So you do 35,000 times 2.5%, which gives you $875, which gives you $875. Zakat on pensions, access and control, to be Zakatable pensions must be either accessible or controllable or both. If pension is locked and cannot be accessed until a specific maturity date, there is no control over the funds and thus there is no Zakat up and until you have access. Once maturity date is reached and a person has full access to the fund, then Zakat is paid immediately and then every year after that, every year after that, meaning you don't have to retroactively pay your zakat. You don't have to retroactively pay your zakat. Zakat on pensions continued. If a pension is locked and cannot be accessed until a specific maturity date, but there is control over the funds, then there is zakat. Then there is zakat due. So if you do not have access and do not have control, there's no zakat until you have access. However, if you do not have access, but you have control, an example of this would be a defined contribution pension plan. Here, the fund may not be accessible, but the contributor has a choice over how it is invested, has a choice over how it is invested, then zakat would be calculated on it as such. Zakat would be calculated on it as such. And this is, is the formula that you would use. 
So you can use either the whole amount or the alternative is to treat it like an investment property and consider whatever amount you would be withdrawing over the years and pay zakat on that amount once you withdraw it, once you withdraw it. Other types of pensions, defined contribution plans, depends on how it is invested. If in an equity fund, then purify your gains and pay zakat on the whole amount, meaning after you've purified it from the haram that is in it, then you pay zakat on that, on that amount. If in the money market or low interest vehicle, then pay zakat on your own contributions and not on the interest that is in it, not on the interest that is in it. And this is only on those scenarios where you cannot get out of this situation. If you have the ability to change these investments to something that is halal or less haram, you are required to do so. You are required to do so. Locked in retirement accounts, liras are zakatable if the investment is controlled. Otherwise, they are not zakatable. Otherwise, they are not zakatable. Canada pension plan, these are not zakatable because you do not have control nor access. And same thing with defined benefit plan. Now, zakat and mortgages. Zakat and mortgages. So, if an individual has a mortgage, and I want to speak about this from two different perspectives. Perspective number one, if you have an Islamic mortgage, alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and reward you for supporting Muslim infrastructure and for you pursuing something halal. If you have taken a conventional mortgage, I would advise you, please do not take it upon yourself to make ijtihad and always speak to your local sheikh and imam to see if you are eligible to take a conventional mortgage. If you're eligible to take a conventional mortgage, make sure you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment with a clear conscience, with a clear conscience. Now, you calculate what your monthly payments are going to be for the next 12 months, and you can deduct that from your zakat. You can deduct that from your zakat. And understand that there is a difference of opinion. Some scholars recommend you do not deduct mortgage liability unless you are fearful that you will be unable to pay your mortgage, unless you are fearful that you're unable to pay your mortgage. But I believe it is fine. Note, if one can pay off uh, an interest-bearing loan sooner than later and avoid more interest payments, then this is highly encouraged to pay off before paying zakat. And as we mentioned, the default ruling of being in zakat, uh, of being in debt is that it is discouraged. And if it is an interest-bearing debt, that can be avoided. It is mandatory to get out of it as soon as possible. It is mandatory to get out of it as soon as possible, unless you have a specific fatwa that allows you to do so, that allows you to do so. And Allahu Akbar, we have made it to the Q&A section. We have made it to the Q&A section. And inshallah ta'ala, now we will address your uh, questions and comments. Adil, Jazakallah khair for sharing that link. Thank you so much. So my dear brothers and sisters, if you look in the webinar chat box, you'll see that our brother Adil Siddiq has shared a link on how to calculate zakat on shares and investments. This is a more detailed presentation on how to calculate your zakat on uh, shares and investments. And it talks about the uh, zakat asset ratio uh, and uh, quite a few other things as well. Very beneficial for those of you that are into investing and have investment accounts. Now, let's get into uh, the questions. Um, so, we have... Um, okay, hold on. I want to go through all of these questions. So even the ones that have been answered, I want to make sure that they are answered. Can the NZ NZF calculate our zakat if we share details of our savings or investments? If yes, who do we contact? Yes, National Zakat Foundation can help you calculate your zakat. Just go to nzfcanada.com uh, forward slash calculate dash zakat and they can help you over there. Or you can email zakat at nzfcanada.com and they will help you through email as well. Do we have to pay zakat on gold or jewelry? Also, what about gold that we do not wear? So the position of National Zakat Foundation is zakat is due on all jewelry. As for gold squares, then this is considered bullion and pure gold. Then zakat is due on them. Zakat is due on them. Now, uh, the question says, are funds that are set aside specifically for retirement 
and invested zakat eligible. So funds that are set aside for retirement, yes, they are uh, zakat eligible. As to them being invested, depending on how they're invested and what type of account they're in, if you have access and control, they are zakatable. If you do not have access or control, then they are not zakatable. They are not zakatable. Then we have a question from uh, with that says, with respects to investments, meaning mutual funds that change in value on a monthly or annual basis, which amount will be uh, zakatable? The value in the beginning of the year or the value at the end of the year? So the general rule is, it is the value on the day that you pay your zakat, the value that you pay on the, on the day that you're paying your zakat. And the exception to this, the exception to this, is if you're invested in something that is extremely volatile. So for example, on the day that you're paying your zakat, you notice that it drastically went down by like 50% or drastically went up by 50%, then you use the average price at that time. Then you use the average price at that time. But this is only for things that are extremely volatile. In all the other cases, you use the zakat on the day that your zakat, uh, day on the, on the value on your zakat date. Is zakat paid on the amount accrued within a specific period of time, or is it paid on all you have at any given time? There are multiple ways of doing this. You could pay your zakat in advance monthly, or you could hold on to all of your assets, and then on the zakat date that you've selected, on that date, you uh, calculate your assets uh, that are zakat eligible and pay your zakat at that time. Both uh, ways are permitted. And it is up to you to uh, do the one that is easiest for you. Any zakat that you pay in advance, then on your zakat date, you would deduct from it. You would you would deduct from it. Can you kindly clarify what is meant by funds are accessible and under control? So, for example, if you have a self-directed uh, TFSA account, this is an example of funds that are accessible and under con your control. So you get to choose what they're being invested in, and you can withdraw that money at any given time without any form of taxation, without any form of taxation or penalty. So the zakat fun as, uh, funds that are accessible and under your control. Whereas uh, your RRSP, depending on the type of RRSP account that you have, you are able to control what you're investing in but you don't have full access to it. You don't have full access to it. So because you don't have full access to it, whatever penalties you would pay with regards to you removing uh, this, uh, the, this money from your RSP, then you would deduct the penalty that you would pay and calculate the zakat on that amount. Calculate the zakat on that amount. So that is what we mean by funds that are in your control and that are accessible. Next question. Money invested in mutual funds are not under one's control, but can be accessed if we withdraw the money. So can how can we treat them while they are being invested? How can we treat them while they are being invested? In summary, it is going to be a very complicated process if you were to do the zakat eligible ratio, because you'd have to find out all of the companies and then calculate zakat on each individual company and then pay your zakat. That is a complicated way. The easy way is just to take the amount, uh, the total value of the mutual fund on the date of that your zakat is due and pay it on the total amount. You will end up paying more, but this is the easy way out. This is the easy way out. In other ways, you can also uh, contact National Zakat Foundation, tell them your circumstance, tell them the mutual fund that you're holding, and then they will tell you how to calculate it. Now, because I don't know what country you're in, I can't really comment on this, but in my experience in Canada, there are very, very few mutual funds that are actually halal. There are actually very, very few mutual funds that are halal. So the first thing we want to do is, if you are invested in mutual funds, make sure that they are halal. If they are not halal, then transfer your money to something that is halal if you're able to. If you're able to, transfer it to something that is halal. If you're not able to transfer it, remove the haram portion from your calculation, and then you would proceed with the calculation. And then you would proceed with the calculation. And please refer to the video that our brother Adil shared in the chat box, shared in the chat box. 
Are there any other questions? Jazakumullah khairan. Any further questions, my dear brothers and sisters? Bismillah. Oh, there we go. We have... Oh. <laughs> it's someone saying, Jazakumullah khairan. Wa iyaki, wa iyaki. And wa iyakum to all of you for that attended. You know, I know it's uh, the middle of the evening uh, for those that are in the East Coast, uh, middle of the afternoon for those that are uh, in mountain time where I am, and West Coast, you guys are like early afternoon, but still the day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and your time for the sacrifices that you have made to be here. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you, Sheikh, for uh, spending the time with us. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakumullah khairan for having me. I thoroughly uh, enjoyed this. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, and if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to contact us on our website, uh, nzfcanada.com, uh, and also by email at zakatanzfcanada.com. So um, I will take a look at the questions. If it's something simple, I'll get back to you. And if it's something that needs to be referred to our shiuf, uh, we will send it on to them and uh, relay their responses to you. All right. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum assalam. Jazakallah khair.